Cold, alone, exhausted and adrift in a tiny raft, around the world yachtsman Elaine Delord was just one wave away from dying. At the bottom of the Southern Ocean, the wildest on earth, the plucky Frenchman knew he would need a miracle to survive. He got the next best thing, an all-Australian rescue effort that defied all the odds. Get ready to chew your fingers because this is an absolute nail-biter. Here's Alex Cullen. It was a race against time. He had no water, no food, his radio was failing. saving this man that's been living in this little, um, what can only be described as a boy. Oh my God, the jet! Oh. His life raft capsized five times. By the slimmest of margins. It was near the end for you. Elaine Delord is alive. Je his incredible story of survival can now be pieced together with the help of eyewitnesses and rescuers. Among them, one of Australia's most accomplished yachtsmen, Don McIntyre. Why do they get in a boat and sail on their own around the world? Well, you know, I've got my own personal views. We're all hunter-gatherers. We used to have to go and kill our food to eat it, you know, and there was adrenaline rushes. Nowadays, life can be very comfortable. It's like, I call it flatlining, where if you get hot, you put the air conditioner on, you get cold, you put the heater on. So life, instead of peaks and trophic, it's very bland. And so facing personal challenges, is, it's inherent in our makeup. In October last year, after retiring from his job as a boat salesman, Alain kissed his girlfriend farewell and set sail from France. Three months later, 500 nautical miles south of Tasmania, he was hit by big seas and a raging storm. And the mat has cassé in four pieces. Flaw, flaw, terminé. This is where we first heard from Elaine. It's uh, approximately 500 miles southeast of Hobart. And at that point, Elaine was still on his yacht. Yeah, we're not expecting any. Dan Redondo was on duty at AMSA the Australian Maritime Safety Authority in Canberra. At first, Elaine didn't ask for help. The yacht's engine was still working and he believed he could limp to Hobart. But he was wrong. His yacht was unstable and kept capsizing. Seven hours after losing his mast, Elaine abandoned ship. Elaine had no choice but to get into his raft um, and luckily had managed to locate the EPIRB inside. He had no food, no water, no survival suit. We received his Rescue. distress beacon. It was one just like this one here, um, a personal locator beacon. One minute after the beacon went off, AMSA's general manager, John Young, activated a search and rescue mission. We then really wanted to get something on scene to find out what was going on. We've got assets going to it right now. A spotted aircraft was scrambled and an alert went out to all ships in the area. The closest, the cruise ship MV Orion, 1,000 kilometres, 52 hours away. It's an isolated part of the world. We're all on our own when we're down south, you know, yeah. On board was Don McIntyre taking tourists from Antarctica to Macquarie Island. Their holiday was about to end. Everyone thought about it for a bit and, and we were all on site and, and it was a case of let's get him. Yeah. Well, there's no question, is there? Oh, yeah, totally. And Don knew all too well the peril Elaine was in. In 1990, he'd capsized racing solo around the world. He just got ro rolled 360. And I miss Ted, and sometimes I really wish I wasn't here, I tell you. How dangerous is the Southern Ocean? It's a, a very uh, treacherous place if you don't know what you're doing. You don't get second chances usually. You get one shot at it. As Orion steamed north towards Elaine, AMSA's aircraft flew south and spotted the Frenchman. 
we had the gravest of concerns for it at that stage. The water down there is around about nine degrees Celsius. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but Elaine tells us that in fact his life raft capsized five times. Um, and he had to get out of the life raft and into the water to right it. So he would have been very cold. If the boat had capsized a sixth time, what would have happened? It's simple, I wouldn't be there. Because after it's the night, so it's not possible. And I can see you're getting quite emotional. Is it? Is this hard to talk about? Ça se voit. Oui, c'est difficile. Oui, c'est très difficile. We knew he had uh, he had no water, no food. His radio was failing and uh, that it was very cold. For Elaine to survive, Wing Commander Darren Goldie and his RAAF crew had to find him. His protection is number one. Their life-saving mission was to deliver a survival suit that would keep him warm and canisters of food and water. From Richmond Air Force Base near Sydney, they flew south more than 2,000 kilometres. This is the actual video footage taken from on board a Hercules C-130. In the middle of all this ocean, they were looking for a raft the size of a bar top. After three hours in the air, finally, a bright orange speck. Elaine's little raft. He's 500 nautical miles, so you know the best part of a thousand kilometres south of, of Hobart towards uh, towards Antarctica, and, and that's quite a lot of water to finally see a little man floating in a little life raft. So uh, it's quite a feeling of elation, I guess, to, to physically find him. Ah, non, le bruit d'un le bruit d'un avion, on dit, donc c'est c'est bah c'est c'est voilà c'est 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 formidable. The crew dropped the survival suit, water, and food within metres of the raft. If it wasn't for the airdrop supplies, he would not be with us now. There's no question. But he was still all alone and at sea. Don McIntyre and the crew of Orion were still 33 hours away. Another Hercules crew returned to drop flares near the raft and guide the Orion in for the final rescue. On board, the passengers were anxious. So as we move closer into a lane, the boat is rocking enormously and we're being thrown around because they've had to take the stabilizers off. But anything is worth, of course, saving this man that's been living in this little, um, what can only be described as a boy. Oh my God, the jet! John, what's going on right this second? Uh, literally about uh, 60 seconds ago, we got our first visual sighting of the raft. All the teams are in position. The thing now is everyone takes a deep breath, slows down and relaxes because this is where we're about to play. Don, Don, Mike. The first plan was to pull alongside and bring Elaine on board through a door just above the waterline. But as the door opened, a wave flooded the lower deck. The water came through here, it's all flooded. Oh, through here, it was probably knee deep, you know, knee deep. flushing through. And, and this was the passageway where we had one guy standing on the thing and he nearly got, by the force of the water, he nearly got washed down the stairs. It was just like a scene out of Titanic. Tell him we're going to go to his position, stop, launch him Instead, a rescue boat was launched. Orion's Tim Spark, the first to reach a lane. I bent over and yelled to him. What was his reaction? Um, it was a smile and a wave. You know, he was just sort of lying on the bottom going, smiling and waving, so no worries. So basically I put my arms out and said, grab my arms. Yeah. And that's when he handed me a barrel. OK. So I grabbed the barrel and threw it in, put my arms out again, and he handed me another barrel. Grabbed that, threw it in, turned around, grabbed him and pulled him in. Do you hear that? And he's on! He's on! He's 
Sean! They yeah, caught him. The barrels for these things at uh, AMSA, uh, the aircraft had actually dropped for him. He didn't want to be responsible for the loss of AMSA survival equipment. How nice is that? And yet he lost all of his gear, his diaries, his laptop, camera, lost everything. He came aboard with one little knife. And he's on! He's on! He was fantastic because he was alive and he was standing there and he was smiling and there was these beady eyes just looking straight at me and I went, I've just got to hug a Frenchman. And I gave him this big hug, but he gave us this big laugh at the same time. And all I could say was, it's going to be OK, you're home, just relax. And then, you know, I had my arm around him and giving him a cup of tea. Yeah, he's a tough Frenchman. He's a wiry old Frenchman. He's tough as old boots. And, uh, yeah, he was in good nick, wasn't he? His he's... hands were very swollen yeah. and white. His hands had... It's like sitting in the bath for hours. You know how your skin goes white and swollen? Except his was ten times worse. He literally couldn't move his fingers. They were like sausages. He improved markedly once he'd had a good cuddle. There was no doubt about that. He... <laughs> Look at her. <that>. Hey. <laughs> oh, darling. <laughs> <laughs> After his rescue, a fragile Elaine was determined to thank all those aboard the Orion. He poked fun at his dream to sail unassisted around the world. In the days that followed, Elaine thanked as many of his rescuers as he could. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much for... When you add them all up, so many had a hand in saving the stranded sailor. Pleasure. Good. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. We normally ask for crownings. <laughs> I would guess it's somewhere around 100. Um, maybe a little more. That's a lot of people. It is. It was a very complex um, operation with a lot, a lot of different threads to it. C'est fromage. <laughs> Elaine's very lucky. On a scale of 1 to 10. 1 to 10? Ooh, 10 to 11. 11. But in the situation, we believe it because we have déclenché the balise. So it's. But it's actually today that I can say that I'm not far away.